um, yeah, I know let's start the meeting at eight or six thirty-three. Um, I'll pull your Roxbury Board of School Commissioners, um, and we need to check attendance. So, uh, acknowledging Emma has stepped out. Uh, why don't we start with Jill? Here. Jerry. Here. Mara. Here. Bridget. Here. Madiket. Here. Andrew. Here. And we will get um, Emma's acknowledgement when she comes back. Um, public comment. Do we have any members of the public who wish to make comments? Um, I see there's a No. Okay. Um, on to the next item, which is um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, let's take a vote. Jill? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Annika? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And Ryan? Aye. Okay, on to uh, board discussion, uh, policy monitoring reports um, and COVID-19. Um, and the policy monitoring reports uh, unless there's anything you want to say, Libby, uh, any questions? Um, I just want to chime in here because Ryan sent an email on this. Actually, Ryan, maybe you should kick things off and then I'll chime in. Does that make sense? No, that'd be fine. I could just send out kind of a summary of what I noticed this morning. Um, there had been, I guess, something dropped in the last year with these two fiscal policies. Um, Libby had highlighted essentially the same um, comments in regards to what needed to be updated on the policies. And back in, it was probably May 2019, um, the policy committee had made those changes and it just never made it back to the board for approval and adoption again. Um, so I think, I must, and Andrew, do you remember? At what yeah, it was referred, it, they were referred to the finance committee and that was, it was around the time of the retreat and then the the building committee got off the ground and we were heading back into another round of negotiations and it was very similar people so we were we we dropped we dropped the ball on it it really should come to the finance committee and we should review it with grant that was the plan and that never happened and then what's the step after that then, the then the finance committee brings it back to the board, I think, with any proposed changes, and um, we go from there. And so I suggest, I, I put a note down when I was going through things, I suggest that we have a new finance committee, and I think we should pick this back up next month after the retreat um, and after school's out of session, and probably get something on the calendar sooner rather than later so that we can have those discussions and go through those policies. So um, are those, the draft policies, where are those located right now? Oh, okay. the, the ones that have been updated but that were never actually adopted, I can probably track down and dig up. Would you, Ryan, would you mind sending those? And I can look, I think you sent those to, um, some point last summer when we were talking to the finance committee about these policies, I bet they did make it to you, but. Uh, yeah, I think I think you sent them out then when we were beginning to talk about this in like July or something. Yeah, we should verify that we do have what would be the most up-to-date drafts to work with. Yeah, and so if you wouldn't mind sending that to the, who who else on the finance committee right now? It's me, Anna Kit, and Jill, is that right? I think that's right. If you wouldn't mind sending those to the three of us, and then we can get a finance committee meeting on the calendar for uh, late June, mid to late June, somewhere in there. 
Okay, excellent. Um, talking about committees, do we need to assign Emma uh, to a committee or committees? And we had some back and forth about that. We can probably do that in the next meeting, but um, that's definitely a to do. And which, Emma, remind us which committees we're interested in or does it? I'm open to what, um, you know, where there is a need. Got it. Um, Okay, perfect. We can we can uh, give us a thought and um, we can uh, we can address it at our next meeting. Uh, any other uh, comments about the uh, monitoring reports, the policy monitoring reports? No. <laughs> Libby, anything you want to say? Uh, no, we can just get all those changes made in the policy. I think. We're, there may have been others throughout this year. We want, we'll want to look at the monitor reports throughout the school year to see if there's any others that needed changing. I think there are a couple other suggestions from a couple of them, but we can look through the monitor reports to find those. Okay. The policy committee, maybe that might be good summer work to do. Does it, make, does it make sense for the policy committee on an annual basis to, or on some kind of routine basis? I don't know if more frequent or on some kind of routine basis to consider these proposed changes from the administration so that they don't just hang out there. I think we might want to have a process just for what happens when there's a monitoring document with suggested changes to language. Yeah. Uh, the policies that we're working off of right now were where the policy, I can imagine Bridget and Ryan can speak up to this, but okay. I can imagine we're the best guests from a newly merged district, right? So we have, um, we have a couple of years under our belt now, and so we can we can look at those a little differently, maybe. I mean, it might make sense if, if, as the monitoring report is considered by the board and suggest changes, if the board then decides to kick it at that point to the policy committee to consider the changes instead of waiting for another, you know, scheduled look at it. Yeah, another round. Andrew, the old policy committee had considered giving ourselves a schedule to make sure that we were addressing and monitoring all the policies each year, but had felt in the end that that would just be not necessarily cumbersome, but maybe not effective, just reviewing things, just to review things that weren't necessarily in need of any updates or modifications. But yes, we should be monitoring constantly the policy monitoring reports that Libby puts forward and any suggestions that she makes for any changes in laws that we need to update, we'll definitely need to address quickly. The other piece to consider is that we're now, we're moving into year three for these, most of these policies, because like I said, they were redone right at the merger. So um, we'll be putting some thought into which ones we want to bring up first in a cycle of review so that we're not doing all policy all the time, but maybe we might want to start this year on reviewing some of these policies that the policy monitoring group could maybe look at first. Does that make sense? No, that seems totally reasonable. And maybe the policy committee could talk with you about prioritizing where you would expect to see the policies that would need the most attention immediately. Yeah. Not immediately, but first. There may be a few, <laughs> knowing what's coming up. Policy committee has been talking about getting a meeting scheduled, so. <laughs> uh, um, so we want to, I mean, they're just reports. So we want to approve the reports with the idea that we need some follow-up um, actions. the reports need to be amended. I'm fine with that. I mean, the reports are really a feedback mechanism for the board, correct, Libby? Yeah. From Jim? So, I mean, I, I think, I think yeah. they've accomplished, I, I think they've accomplished their goal here, which is reminding the board that we, um, we dropped the ball on something. It, fortunately, it's not a, it's not, the, the most important of things, but it is important nonetheless, and we should pick it back up sooner rather than later. So I think 
picking it up soon after the retreat makes sense. And I, I guess I would make a motion that we approve the policy monitoring reports with the plan. We don't even need the plan as part of the motion. So I just make a motion that we approve the policy monitoring reports. We could definitely put looking at the policy into policies into our board retreat as well. That might be a nice agenda item. Okay. Second to Andrew's motion. No. Uh, so. Joel Garrett A. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Jim. Uh, Jim, yeah. you oh. your season a little bit. Why don't you turn your video off? Hi. No, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Jill. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Uh, Mara. Bridget. Aye. Annika. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Ryan. Aye. And Emma. Aye. Great. Um, Okay, next on the agenda is COVID-19. Uh, so, Libby, I think that's you and whoever from your team. Yep, we have um, our central office leadership team with us, with Bill also, um, in case there's any special education questions, which is great, that he'll try to answer the best he can, being the newbie. Um, and we also have Mike Berry, Director of Curriculum Instruction, Grant Geisler from Finance, and um, Andrew LaRosa from Buildings and Grounds, uh, just to make sure if anybody has any questions that we can answer them. Our plan tonight is to share um, what is going forward. So often we're kind of in this place of what are we doing right now? And it's it, we're still in crisis mode, um, but there are plenty of really exciting things around curriculum and learning and professional capacity building for our staff. So I've asked Mike to share that with you all. These plans were in place well before COVID um, and they still fit. Um, and one thing we're, we're coming to realize that in, regardless of what environment we're teaching and learning in, good teaching is good teaching. And we need to keep remembering that. So I wanted to um, show that to the community of what we're really focusing in on and, and what we're spending some well-earned tax dollars on in terms of professional learning. And then Grant, Andrew and I will go through what is happening with the um, finances in the sense of what are we thinking and where can where do we think our savings are for both fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 in this current moment. So um, I will share my screen so everybody can, oh, hold on. Anna, you gotta let me share my screen there, bud. She disabled me, she took my power. Okay, we're back. All right, so let's get off my email. You don't need to see that. You don't need to see that. Hold on. The one tab I need is covered by Zoom right now. Hold on one second. How do I move that? Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Uh, my screen clear for everybody? All right, I see Anakin shaking his head, so we're good. So here's just a board update. I'm gonna hand the mic over to Mike Barry to uh, talk about what's being done with curriculum and professional development. Hi, everyone. If uh, I freeze up or drop off, just assume whatever I said was brilliant. And uh, we'll just go from there. Um, so I have two slides in the presentation and there's a lot of text just sharing a lot of the work that as Libby said, we already had planned. Um, but, but now we are continuing that work and it's, it's even more essential. It's, it's kind of exciting actually. So by the end of this year, we'll have a lot of prioritized standards identified K through 12. Um, and that's going to help us launch in the fall to really hit that essential learning, uh, for students. And the staff has done an amazing job of really digging in on that work and, um, doing some fantastic stuff. Uh, we have K through 12 math conversations going right now that are just fantastic. Um, and we're really excited about that work. 
and um, entering the 2021 school year, we're really going to look at that prioritization that we, we have a necessity to prioritize the learning. Um, and that's really driving that work. We're going to work towards a literacy audit K through 12. Um, we have, as I said, a lot of math work going on right now that's very exciting. And we're going to continue that discussion between the middle school and the high school about uh, compacted traditional curriculum and um, an integrated pathway. And then a lot of work around proficiency scales, common assessments, and vertical alignment. And it's, it's all pretty exciting. And that's kind of where we are with curriculum development. And then the next slide, Libby, if you want to go to that next slide. And then I can take questions can about I, both. What, can I ask what literacy audit means? Sure. So a literacy audit is when we have someone come in and look at our existing literacy practices, K through 12, and kind of go through our data, go through our instructional models, go through all of those things and tie them together to help us develop an action plan of how we uh, proceed with some K through 12 work. Um, we've noticed a lot of need for vertical alignment, and vertical discussion, particularly between buildings. Um, so that kind of work really helps us hone in on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and on professional learning, there's a lot of stuff on here. Uh, I apologize for that, but there, I'm really excited about the work that's happening. Um, we are going to continue our work with Math Menu at the uh, kindergarten through fourth grade. And we're actually adding fifth and sixth grade to that mix next year. Um, so that work has been fantastic in individualizing mathematics instruction uh, for students. And then seven through 12 educators are going to continue some work with the teachers development group who we're working with right now um, around mathematical principles of instruction. And that has been fantastic. So those folks will come and work with us and do embedded uh, coaching cycles in grades seven through 12. So we're really excited about that. Um, we've had a lot of learning opportunities through this COVID event, um, amazing access to presenters and to speakers and to uh, thought partners around the, the world, really. Um, and staff have been taking full advantage of that. So that's been great. And the interventionists and special educators have been meeting on a regular basis to work out uh, what we call micro progressions. So those little steps between notches uh, for students to move along towards proficiency or success. And then next year, all of that stuff's kicking into overdrive even more. Um, and we've got all sorts of coordinated professional development happening next year that we're really excited about. And what's nice is we're in a place where we're planning for that kind of regardless of whether we're in person or, or, or remote. And uh, we've been able to do quite well in that planning. Um, and we're, we're excited. So it's going to happen regardless is, is kind of what I'm saying. And I did a lot of talking, so I'll just answer some questions if anyone has them. Questions for Mike? What is, um, what is Math Menu? So Math Menu is a time in a mathematics classroom where students may be moving around the room and interacting with different uh, challenging mathematics exercises. And it's also a way to ensure that students are getting a chance to work with their teacher um, every time so that they're getting some of the best instruction that they can from the most qualified person in the room. And it's a way for us to align data and assessment and instructional needs of students in a way that's manageable for teachers. Uh, our K through four teachers, both at Roxbury and at UES, have absolutely loved this method, and we implemented it this year. Um, and now the next layer is to come back and really dig into that data analysis and how are we assessing students' needs um, through formative assessment and, and summative assessment, and how does that change and inform instruction? So it's really exciting. Any other questions for Mike? Mike, could you talk a little bit about data collection and how that's going and informing some of it? Sure, I can talk about what we've been doing. Um, so we've been, the first step is really identifying those prioritized standards. So what are, the, what are the big things that we're promising students are going to succeed and learn? Um, and then the proficiency scales, which kind of guide us along that path of where a student is in achieving that prioritized standard. 
Um, so that's the kind of data that we're looking to collect and really gain some assessment literacy uh, as a district around how do we assess that. You know, there's everything from a, a, a quick check-in that can really inform your instruction, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways, how are you on this, all the way up to maybe, you know, um, uh, individual check-ins or um, the regular summative types of assessments that we give at the end of units or things like that. But it's tying that all together to really inform instruction in a timely manner so that we can change our approach. And Math Menu is a way that, that provides an opportunity for teachers to do that. I have a couple of questions, Mike. This is Andrew here. Um, I'm just curious to know, what are some of the silver linings that you see coming out of this that can improve education at large? Um, yeah. Simple question, really simple. Um, really, really easy. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there's a lot of silver linings. You know, it's interesting as a curriculum director, I talked to my colleagues and, and we've all kind of whispered this, this thing where we say, some of the work is easier now. Um, it's, it's a silver lining is that it's allowed us to, to emphasize and display the importance of the work that we're doing. So prioritizing standards has become essential work and everybody's on board. Um, the work that we had already completed prior to this came in super handy. So people were super on board with that. I think the ability to provide professional development in very flexible ways has opened up a whole world for people. Um, we were able to do some very high quality professional development early on uh, around technology and curriculum and instruction. And we saw big returns on that. Um, so I think that in the future, you're gonna see a lot of, uh, a lot more um, maybe online opportunities or a hybrid of you can do this in person or you can do this online. And that kind of opens up accessibility for people in ways that I don't think we, we recognized before. I, I think our default was let's get everybody in a room, let's figure out how we can do something in two hours and you know what, that's how we'll do professional learning. And now we've, we've discovered ways to provide menus of learning for teachers that, that are, are more effective and more appreciated, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think we've learned a lot about what works for student learning and, and what works for family support that um, you know, we didn't know before. I think this experience has also shown us exactly where we need to shore up our systems. Um, so that it's given us an opportunity to recognize some gaps that we need to address right away that, that we would have discovered eventually, but probably not in such a succinct and, and compact way. And I'll think of something else later, but I'll send it to you. Thank you. Great, thanks Mike. Um, other questions for Mike? Um, I have a question, Mike. I just wanted to get sort of uh, the update on the um, health curriculum, if you were moving forward with one, if you had chosen a different one. Yeah, so we had, for, for everybody, just the, the update, we had a, a pretty extensive committee and process planned for this spring around um, health curriculum, and it involved using the HECAP process, which is a very in-depth curriculum review process. And we had purchased various curriculum to look at, the kits and everything, and it involved a lot of in-person time. And of course we can't do that now. So what we're trying to do is there are two um, curriculum based uh, products that the Agency of Education has endorsed. One is uh, ET ETR and one is the Planned Parenthood curriculum. And I'm planning to use the auditing tools within the HECAP process to kind of vet those for different strengths and different weaknesses and things that we have as a group really articulated a need for, and then reach back out to that group for feedback so that we can hopefully implement uh, something new in the fall. Great, thanks, Mike. Other questions, Emma? I have another one, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what, uh, or do you have any sort of plans or push for like social, emotional, professional development around, you know, how the kids have been away from school for so long and that they may be coming into an environment that they're not familiar with and what kind of professional learning are you doing around that or what are yeah. the plans? 
we have very extensive plans, um, extremely extensive plans. Mary Bechtel, our SEL coordinator, has a, a, what I can best describe is one of the most complete plans I've ever seen um, to really address a lot of things, starting um, thinking about it developmentally, but also thinking about procedurally and social norms and you know our social norms are going to be different in this environment and how do we address that with students k through 12 how do we how do we have consistency from space to space and how do we have consistency from school to school and um, she has a very detailed plan and has already started a lot of the sel um, professional development so we had a session last week um, that a lot of staff attended um, around SEL coordination. She's also working with all the social workers and guidance counselors. And um, I feel very confident in saying that we are completely addressing that for the fall. We also just hired a BCBA um, to replace a position that a person who is retiring, um, which is a highly skilled, I mean, master's level degree in behavior behavior management and things like that. So um, we have a really good hire coming in to be Mary Bechtel's partner, which is exciting as well. Great, no, that is all um, very good stuff. Uh, other questions for Mike? <laughs> Looks like we're back to Libby or Libby, do you have, who's next? Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so now is a financial update. One of the, what we wanted to do just like last board meeting is we wanted to show you all the places that we're thinking about for savings, um, potential savings, both this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Um, as we're still living in the land of unknown of what the how we're gonna fill the ed fund as a state um, to get it back to being solvent. So um, we've taken considerable a time, Grant, Andrew, myself, to think about where are we? So for fiscal year 20, and Grant is on the line as well. So Grant, I encourage you to speak up and Andrew as well, um, whenever you see something here. Um, fiscal year 20 anticipated savings. This year, we had two unfilled um, instructional assistant positions at Main Street Middle School. One because of retirement mid-year and the other because of an unfortunate death, unfortunately, um, that just were never, we were never able to fill them. We posted them, but we were never able to fill them. So we know what that savings amount is. It's $50,000 for a half a year. Um, we received a daily busing credit from uh, our busing company, STA, because they recognized that we weren't using their, their services anymore, and that is $50,000. Without spring sports, so that was the 30,000s of savings. Our school resource officer, Matt Nisley, who was our school resource officer, got a promotion to detective um, at Montpelier Police Department. And his replacement, um, right when she was coming on to be a replacement, had significant jaw surgery. And so for most of, for the half of the year that she was supposed to be with us, she was at actually recovering from jaw surgery and not actually allowed to be in the field. So the Montpelier Police Department were great and responded whenever we needed them. However, we didn't have a school resource officer and we typically split that cost with the Montpelier Police Department. So we reached out to them and said, hey, we didn't have a school resource for most of the year. We still don't need one now in this situation. So that's a savings of about $27,000. Um, in terms of books that weren't bought because of our situation, we had savings about $25,000, adding on the same for supplies. For field trips for the spring, spring is a huge time for field trips, understandably, um, and those aren't being taken, which saves about $20,000. And then we also talked about last time the RVS.5 FTE custodian. We had that filled. That person went to a full-time position that we had in Montpelier, so we posted for the half-time position and that was never able to be filled and our custodial staff was able to fill that need at Roxbury without um, filling the position. So overall for, for this year, these are real savings that we know that is about $241,000 that will be going into our fund balance. Um, we do have some expenditures for um, COVID-19 expenses. 
but we also have savings in things like electricity and heat and water and paper towels and that kind of thing that we don't know the exact number for that, but we're making the prediction that it somewhat evens out for um, fiscal year 20 in regards to our expenditures and our savings in other areas and buildings and grounds. Grant, do you wanna add on to anything about that? No, I, I would, I think you've got that perfect um, there. As you said, there are some expenses that aren't on here that we know about that we think are going to be offset. I think maybe the biggest wild card in those expenses that uh, we don't show here is food service. We're really not sure, you know, what kind of impact this is having on food service. We, we've lost a lot of revenues, um, but we are getting a lot of revenue in for the meals that we're providing, which more than covers that. And some of our expenses are down because we don't have as much fresh fruit and vegetables, that kind of thing. So that one's still kind of a wild card that I'm, I'm not sure uh, is going to kind of balance out or, or not. But I think these numbers are pretty conservative. So I think FY20, we are going to be adding to the fund balance. I have a question for you, Grant. So should we assume as the board that we're going to have roughly a $240,000 increase to the fund balance that we discussed at last meeting? I am hopeful that it's around that area, yes. If you were to budget an amount, would you budget it at $240,000 or do you think that the ups might be more than that and it might be prudent to budget it closer to $200,000? Well, you know, you know me, I'm conservative by nature, so I probably would say 200, but that's how we ended up with a million dollar fund balance. So um, I would say, honestly, right now, I would probably budget a, an increase of two, about 240. And that's on top of, I believe, what we were showing as an available fund balance of like 888 is what we had been projecting. Yeah, so, that's right. So just so the board's aware, that what that does our fund balance as a percentage of our FY 21 budget because we're talking about this heading into the next fiscal year is three point we were talking about it last time is 3.5 percent this would increase it to 4.5 percent which would add to our our ability to respond to financial um financial difficulties next year and the year after um I just want to say I don't think that you know, this isn't the time that you want to add to your fund balance to really pad your reserves. But we know heading into next year and the year after that, we're going to have some some very difficult financial waters to navigate, and so we can use this then to navigate those circumstances. That is exactly the story we want to tell. And I would also add that um, you know the there was this guidance that 2% of the budget is what we wanted to maintain as a fund balance. I would kind of argue that the reason why we wanted to have at least 2% was for something like this that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even be worried if we dropped a little below 2% because it, you know this is why we build a fund balance for something dramatic like this and we're fortunate to have it. So I'm, I'm feeling really good about where we are compared to where other districts are. Grant, one, one other question for you on this, and Libby, I, I don't know um, where we are in terms of CRF, uh, uh, co what is it, the? The CARES funds. CR yeah, exactly. The Coronavirus Relief Fund um, dollars. Yeah, where are we in terms of that, in terms of amounts, when we might get it, what we might be able to use it for? Last information that we got on that, Andrew. Sorry, can you hear the mic? Uh, motorcycles in the background. The last information we got back right now, it's being held up and it's being held up for two reasons. And I'm not positive if we talked about this in the last board meeting. The first reason is that it was going to be sent to the states and the states were going to, at least our state, I don't, can't speak for others, but our state was going to use our title one allotment percentages to, for, for deciding how much each school district was going to get. So they're going to look at our free and reduced lunches, um, lunch numbers to determine what number of the CARES funds we were gonna be able to access. The feds, after that decision was made, the feds, so the Department of Education at the federal level decided that um, 
they that for private schools, schools that lay in Montpelier Roxbury boundaries, but are not part of our school system, they're private, they would get an, an amount of CARES funding that was equal to how Title II dollars are allotted, which Title II is for the entire population. So there was a there's a disconnect and an inequity as to how funds, according to the feds, were going to be allotted between private and public schools. As a result, the the nationwide, you know, superintendents association and all kinds of different associations were using political pressure to change that decision because that's a significant inequity. In essence, what would happen is we would get probably around two hundred forty five thousand dollars based on our Title One dollars. And then we'd have to take some of that $245,000 and give it to private schools based on their entire enrollment rather than their SES population. So our allotment is based on SES, their allotment would be on their entire school population, um, which is unfair. It's inequitable and it's unfair. So national organizations are fighting against that. So it was held up for that reason first. The second reason I'm told it's being held up is because the state is truly trying to figure out the best way to fill this fund balance or this, I'm sorry, ed fund deficit. Um, and they're trying, and I think they're trying to look at all the different ways that they can use that money. So we haven't seen it. We haven't seen an application for it. Um, we have a weekly talk with, with uh, Dan French, the secretary of education on Thursday. So I'm assuming he always gives us an update as to where that stands. And I'm assuming I'm gonna, we're gonna hear about it tomorrow. That was a long-winded answer, but no, I, I it appreciate it. I had heard I had heard something about the private schools, but I I didn't I didn't understand or know what the issue was. So that's extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a wait and see game right now. We don't know what we're going to get if we're going to get anything. Um, I've got a question, uh, Grant. Sure, you go mentioned um, the biggest wild swing is the food services um, in terms of. The worst case scenario, what are we talking in terms of numbers or dollars? The worst case scenario, if we don't get the reimbursement and all that. We don't, Grant, you wanna give that a go? We were just talking about it about four hours ago. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, that's a, that's a real tough question. Um, the revenues we're losing are the adult sales and the students that they pay full price and some catering. Those are the revenues we're losing we're actually getting more reimbursement from the federal government for the meals that we are providing. Um, my guess is, you know, maybe we're talking about, you know, an additional $50,000 um, on above what we had budgeted as a deficit, but it's really hard to tell. Um, you know, I may be surprised it may not be that much because like I said, the amount of money it costs to, to um, put together a, a big, uh, salad bar with all the fresh fruits and fruits and vegetables every day that's that's a huge cost and we we're not seeing that so it may not be it's it's the thing that's probably the most uncertain to me but it's not we're not talking about something that's hundreds of thousands of dollars uh that makes sense thanks if there's no more questions i'm happy to take any more questions about fy20 but we can move on to F Y21 as well. Yeah, like, go for it unless others have questions. Okay. And we can take questions on either slide um, going forward. So with FY21 anticipated savings, Grant, Andrew, and I sat down last week sometime and really had, had it out as to what construction projects fell under health and safety and what we really needed to have happen. And what were the projects that we had budgeted for that, that are important, but not necessarily need to do next year. Um, we also talked about which projects could we potentially move into a capital fund. And so we figured the savings amount here for construction projects next year was around $150,000 potential. Those two unfilled IA positions are again, the two unfilled that were from FY20 that we just didn't fill mid year, and we were able to service students and and do those do those duties without those two filled positions. So um, I, I would recommend we riff those two IA positions that don't affect staff. They have no no person in those positions right now. We had in our budget for FY21 the weekend custodian, 
If I were a Benton girl, um, I would imagine that our buildings will be closed to community access uh, on the weekends and in the evenings based, for, based on safety precautions. We, we don't have the authority to allow people into our buildings now or to use our space. And I believe that will be continued. Um, so not filling the weekend custodian that was already budgeted is approximately a $20,000 savings. Um, again, that 0.5 RVS custodian, we did it for half a year this year um, with the guys and, and Donna that we have on staff. So that would be a savings of $28,000 if we decided to continue to not fill that 0.5 custodian. And like I said, that was a, we couldn't fill it. We couldn't find somebody to, to, do, to do that work. Um, and Andrew's here so he can answer any questions about construction or the custodial crew because he knows that best. Field trips, my, again, and my hunch is we're not going to be allowed to do field trips next year. There won't be many things open. It will be hard to do the safety precautions that we need to do so that we budget for $60,000 in field trips every year. Our SRO is again our, our safety resource officer with Montpelier Police Department. So that's just a portion of it when we're not in session here. And then fall sports is the big question. Oh, I'm sorry. The SRO, I'm sorry. I messed that up. That's actually a real savings because um, the, we got the invoice for the SRO for next year, and it was $10,000 cheaper. So we actually know what that is. Um, and then fall sports, we're not sure if those are going to be a go or not. So we decided to put that on the slide. That's, a, that's probably the weakest potential savings right now, but it's still a potential savings. So these positions all together would be $371,000 of savings out of what is already budgeted for FY21 that has passed the, the vote. Um, so Grant, Andrew and I are happy to take any questions on this slide. I just want to add something for that. It was something that I looked at after you sent this yesterday, Libby, and this is just for the board. If we even realize half of these FY21 savings and we realize the $241,000 that would have us at five point between the fund balance and these savings at 5.2% of our FY21 budget, which would really give us a lot of flexibility to uh, help the community and respond to financial hardship while still ensuring that we provide high quality, um, a high quality education for our students in our community. So thank you for your work on this. Should I wait to be called on or should I? This is Jill. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Andrew can hear me. Yeah, no, sorry, Jill. I was talking for those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just had two quick questions that I think I think I know the answers to. So the the IA positions, is it possible that there are students that would be incoming in the fall that we're not aware of that might have an IEP that requires some sort of aid that we would be responsible for? In which case you guys probably have some sort of buffer built in or perhaps that's not how special ed funding works. I was just wondering. No, that you're you're pretty on target. These particular IAs were um, more dedicated to small group work at MSMS. Um, and so they weren't one on one IAs. We have an IA crew of 34 people and I'm sorry, that's my dog. And 13 of them are one on ones. So we have a we have more people that could fill that need. Okay. And then my other question was just about the, the custodial piece. And again, this is belaying my ignorance, but I, I, I'm hoping, I'm assuming that it still means that the schools would get some sort of a deep clean, whether it's Friday evening or something like that, so that when students come back on Monday, because I do have a feeling that, you know, I've thought a lot about our conversation the last time we met and about what staff could be used for. And it seems like, um, custodial staff will be really um, critical to sort of meeting those hygiene pieces. So I'm not in any way advocating to, you know, consider changing this, but I'm just, I'm wondering if the, if the regular Monday through Friday staff will also be doing some kind of cleaning Friday night so that Monday morning when the kids come in and the student and the staff come in, it's been pretty thoroughly cleaned. Maybe that's how it is now. I don't know, but just one to ask. Andrew, you want to, you want to take that? Yeah. Um, I would say that, that, if Tom Allen, the head of custodial services, was here, uh, he could 
he could go through, and I would suggest that before the school starts, that we actually invite him to one of these meetings so he can explain the process. But there's different layers of cleaning and levels, and he has an anticipation of an elevated level. Uh, the biggest challenge that, and I don't need to speak out of school, so to speak, but the biggest thing we're going to have to do is that limiting of outside sort resource or outside use of our buildings. The staff we have now is thoroughly capable of doing that level of cleaning that's necessary and can do it. It's when they get drawn away and it's in a conversation, Jill, you weren't probably weren't in some of these conversations with them. Uh, there is, when we start having outside groups, that's where the strain really, um, really hits our staff. And, you know, the Roxbury piece, we made it work. It was difficult. It wasn't efficient, but we made it work. Um, the downside was that People had to work a lot of overtime. We had people who would literally work weeks and months without a day off. And it's those things that really pull up the staff. If we, if our custodial staff was focused merely on meeting the needs of the education and the, and the, and the students, I think the staff that he has uh, would work, would work to, the high, to a high standard that everybody expects. It really is going to be that pull at the building that we, we need to be conscious of and make some hard decisions on. Um, Tom's, Tom's, a lot of people don't remember what the buildings used to be like, but Tom's standard is, Tom's expectation, and, and he certainly has achieved it at the high school and we're heading there in the other buildings, is that the buildings are not just super clean on Monday mornings, they're super clean every day. And that Monday morning looks no different than a Thursday morning. And again, at the high school, he's, He's achieved that, and we're heading that direction in the other buildings as well. Um, but we we can't we can't use their time. Um, you know, we need to use their time efficiently. Okay. So, am I? Thank you. Am I understanding correctly that? Because I definitely wouldn't want people to have to work months without vacation. So you're saying if we are able to control the use of the building to just the essential staff and students, that you do think that the staff we have will be able to manage? Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Good. I think that's the expectation. It's uh, another challenge that we're going to have as you guys move around the city and start to see lawns that are growing a little longer than one would expect. Uh, some of the services that we receive from the city with regards to lawn care and field maintenance um, has been, it's going to be minimal this spring, and uh, I honestly don't know what it's going to look like through the summer um, or, for that matter, into the fall. So we may end up take, having to take on some of those responsibilities as well. Our, we haven't heard, we, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I think we should be prepared for that as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate what Andrew said about the custodial staff. I've had the opportunity the last two months or so to really get to know them well, because there's not many of us in the building <laughs> at the time, and we're, the people who have been in the buildings have really taken care of each other when we're there, and I, our custodial crew is top-notch. They're, they're fantastic and they, re, they truly view their job as essential in terms of keeping people safe. And so I have no doubt that they'll be able to do that. Not one doubt at all. They take their job so seriously and do a fantastic, every time I walk into my office now, I kind of smile because it literally smells like disinfectant when I walk in. And it's, it's just because they care and they want to take care of us. And it's fantastic. Um, Tom Allen, his previous position was with Fletcher Allen. So he takes, he takes this stuff seriously and he knows what he's talking about and he knows yeah. what he's supposed to. Um, I had a question related to custodial staff. Um, Libby, at the last meeting you had mentioned and then Andrew mentioned again just now considerable overtime expenses um, with our custodial staff. And I'm wondering, is that a potential savings? Is that what I'm hearing? Or will they maybe have the same overtime? Um, you know, will we still spend out about the same in overtime because they'll be cleaning? Perfectly? No, the, over, the overtime will be saved because if we limit access to community usage of the buildings. Overtime comes into play when our buildings are rented out um, because somebody on staff needs to be there and it's a custodian who needs to be there. So. Um, if we were to be told by the state or the school board decides to limit access to our buildings from the community, 
because of safety precautions and whatnot, um, then our co the overtime wouldn't happen. The wind and how much was that approximately? Do we have a number there? Grant, you want to, I have a number in my head, but I don't want to get it wrong. Grant, do you want to make sure that I'm right? Um, I, I don't know that I would be right. So I'm not going <laughs> to get the number, but I would say one thing is, I don't know that we'll see a big savings in FY21 because we don't budget a huge amount for overtime. What typically happens is we overspend considerably for overtime for custodians. And we cover that because a lot of times it's because we have a vacancy that we couldn't fill um, or that we're getting outside revenue for, for facility use. So we typically don't have nearly enough money budgeted for overtime for custodial, but we cover it with other savings for vacancies or revenues for facility use. So I don't know that I would put it on here. If we did put it on here, I would say maybe somewhere on the order of like 10 to 15,000 maybe um, is what we could save. Um, I don't remember what the budget is, but I'm, I'm uh, I'm thinking maybe around 35 to 40,000 is what we budget for overtime for custodians, but I, I wouldn't swear to it. I had 45 budgeted in my head, so we're around the same. same well, yeah, that's, that's the number, that's the number I would have, I would have thrown out. So I have one more question um, related to the construction savings here. I'm just, um, I'd like to know what those projects are and are they going to be, is is the assumption that we're pushing it down the road. It's not that we're canceling those projects. So the way it typically works, not that we've had a typical year um, yet, but um, what it typically works is every year um, for the last probably 10 years or so, uh, we've gone through beyond the sort of identified projects of a, of a playground or um, something of that nature. We go through and we take about three classrooms in each school and we go in and we put new carpets in them, we paint them and put new ceilings and new lights. And we typically do that to two to three classrooms in each of the buildings. Again, the last couple of years have been a little funky. Um, so what we have done um, is we've taken those projects out. Um, what we're gonna do is, because we've kind of got a little bit of a head start this year, we're going to ideally be able to take the time that we would have spent in the summer um, and get that work done earlier, which allows us two things. It allows us to ideally give the crew a little bit lighter August. Every last couple of years that I've seen these guys, they're working until midnight the day before school opens and they start school, you know, frazzled. And I really want to change that model such that they get done in mid-August, they can go take a couple of weeks with their families, or early August, take a couple of weeks with their families and start the school year as refreshed as everyone else. So we may have that opportunity. Um, but since we're gonna have, since we're gonna be done uh, with our normal maintenance, we're gonna try to take on some of these projects ourselves that we otherwise wouldn't have time to do. Now we're gonna be limited by skill set and time, but I think we will be making some improvements, but we won't be, Typically, like we typically do, hiring a carpet or flooring contract to come in and do six rooms in the district and replace six rooms with the lights and ceilings. We won't be able to do that. What we'll be able to do is say, okay, we've got three weeks left. We got four guys that are available for us. Let's go in and do these three or four rooms ourselves, and we'll try to use our time uh, the best we can that way. Um, Grant, do you want to talk about the uh, sensory room project that shift? Sure, I was going to jump in there about so we have 150,000 as the potential savings two projects make up over half of that. Um, there was uh, in the capital plan we planned to uh, redo some stair stairs at UES we didn't think we would be able to fix them. Um, Andrew was able to get a contractor in to see if we could just kind of do a patch that would work and lo and behold it did work. And so that was like $40,000 that was in the capital plan that we don't need to spend now. And so there's a project at Union for a, this sensory room that is in desperate need of renovation that was for about 40,000. So what we did was we shifted that from the general fund as a requirement into the capital fund. So that saves us like 40,000 right there. 
another thing is I think at, the, at Main Street, we were going to redo a stair, stair tower. And I mean, this, these things cost a lot of money because of all, all the, the height that you're dealing with. Um, so what we were thinking is that we would do maybe just some work there and then push like $40,000 into the next year. So that's another $40,000. And then, so in one case, you have 40,000 that we don't need to do at all. And in the other case, you have 40,000 that we shifted a year. So right there, those two 40,000 each, that's 60, or I'm sorry, that's 80 of the 150,000 right there. And then um, Andrew talked about a lot of the other ones, which are just some of the more routine kind of upgrades we try to do uh, in each school that we can just do a little less. Um, it's a bit of a deferred maintenance issue, but we're not causing some huge bow wave of deferred maintenance that a lot of other schools are dealing with. It's grass. Other questions? I would, I just wanted to jump in one other thing. This is savings, you know, the big, we do have some unknowns on what expenses might be, what unanticipated expenses might be, which is why we're trying to figure out where we can save money. I would say in FY21, the thing that causes Libby and I the most, maybe the most concern on the expense side is what's busing going to look like. We just don't have any idea, um, you know, with social distancing, how many kids can you put on a bus? How many buses are we going to need? How many shifts of buses? So that's one of those kind of big unknowns, which is why we're digging in and trying to find out where we can definitely save money. I mean, could that be significantly more money if we have to, you know, significantly expand busing, maybe both in terms of numbers so we can have proper distancing and then routes if we've got some sort of, you know, staggered school day. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that would be a huge, that would, we could potentially double what we pay in transportation. Yeah. Is it too late for us to, as a board or as, as the superintendent to make some sort of executive decision about the busing in Montpelier? So we're just focusing on getting Roxbury students around? I think it certainly could be. Um, I think it's also something that I'd like to wait and see what the guidance is coming from, because okay. we're, we're talking about this now as what the guidance is now, which could look significantly different by August. There, okay. We might we might also, there, there also might be opportunities, and obviously the board was in favor of expanding busing to the middle school. Um, but there might be opportunities as well to identify, especially in this environment, um, you know, who, where, where the needs are more dire than others, um, if, if we were in that type of situation. So. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like we could either, you know, look at distance or, um, you know, re-examine abilities of, you know, families to get kids there, you know, in other ways, which which may have changed if a lot more people are going to be working remotely, you know, through next year for, you know, social distancing for work policies too. Um, you know, it may actually be easier for, for some families to provide transportation for their kids than, you know, if they, if they had to be working on site. Yeah, there's many unknowns. I mean, there there might be families who decide just I don't want to send my kid on a bus. <laughs> you know, there there's going to be there's yeah. many, too many unknowns right now to make any decisions. But certainly, once we start to get a little bit more solid with plans and guidelines and directives, then um, that will most likely be something the board will have to take up in the summer. Any other questions for fiscal year twenty one or twenty? For that matter. Okay, so uh, the next slide just kind of adds things up. So the total potential savings between the two years is six hundred twelve thousand dollars. Again, this I, this goes into our fund balance to pad it further and for whatever is coming our way. So um, 
I'd like to make the pitch that we that we are in a very solid place going into a very uncertain future financially. Um, and we probably have way more flexibility and we will have way more flexibility than many districts across the state. Um, and so so I'm, I'm feeling good about where we are financially, even with all the uncertainty. Uh, Grant figured out that if they ask us to, they being the legislature, ask us to claw back, if you will, 5% of our ed spending for fiscal year 21, which is well within the realm of possibility, that would be about $350,000. We will be able to do that. Even without the savings, we'll be able to do that. Um, so we're not sure, you know, those COVID expenditures, we talked about that earlier that we're not actually sure what our actuals will be for electricity use and fuel costs over time, mileage, all that kind of good stuff. We just don't know what those actuals are just yet. Um, one thing we are trying to do currently is to bulk up our tech hardware purchases. Um, so we're looking at uh, purchasing about $30,000 in Chromebooks for fiscal year 20 to get those in place so that we bulk up that. We sent out about 350 Chromebooks to kids for this um, remote learning and near over a hundred of them have already come back damaged. Um, and so we're not really sure where we're gonna be in terms of Chromebooks um, and how many we have until we get all of those back after the end of the school year. And our, they have to go in quarantine for a little while. And then we have to get our tech staff to take a look and find out exactly what's going on with all of our Chromebooks to find out exactly what we're gonna be. Um, but we are going to try to make a big purchase by the end of this year in order to, to bulk up our, our hardware supply um, for kids and families. Uh, we will incur more COVID expenditures. We're positive, we're just not sure. And the other, the other thing that's not in these slides for next, next year is that there's going to be savings for new hires. We replaced a lot of retiring teachers who are at the end of our pay scale with brand new teachers who are at the beginning of the pay scale. This is an incredibly hard year for hiring because people just aren't moving from their districts, which is understandable. Um, and so it's a great, it's a boon of a year to hire new graduates that we can mold and shape into uh, what we want. Um, so we're hiring a lot of newer teachers this year, more than we have in the past. Um, or in that like mid range of, you know, step five through nine. Um, and they're replacing people who are paid a lot more. So there will be savings for new hires, uh, which didn't happen last year, but it will happen this year. We just don't know exactly what that's gonna be yet until it all sugars out with our hiring. Any questions on this piece? Yeah, uh, could Grant um, explain the 5% clawback math? Because that, that's a lot less than 5% of the budget. So I just wanna understand the math. Yes, I certainly can. So you, I think in the budget, we just have um, the education spending grant combined with all of the tax revenues that we collect from the municipalities. Um, the amount that we actually get directly from the ed spending grant that we get from the ed fund is about 6.8 to $7 million. That's how much we get from the ed fund each year. And so if you take 5% times $7 million, you would get the 350,000. It's uh, when, when they talk about a, a clawback, they're talking about the ed spending grant, not 5% of your entire budget. You know, so you have your total budget, then you subtract out your local revenues and then you have your ed spending. And then of that ed spending, a lot of that money comes directly from your communities in tax revenue. Um, the piece that's not included there that we get from the ed fund is about 6.8 to 7 million. And I would assume that that's where they would base their, their clawback from. Thanks. And just one other thing on this slide, you know, we, we talk about unknowns that are negative, the one unknown that might be positive here is that these COVID related expenses, if it's something that we can directly say is because of COVID, like purchasing a bunch of new hardware um, or childcare or things like that, we are putting a project code on those to identify them as COVID expenses. 
And it is possible that we might actually get additional money to cover some of those expenses. And Grant, this is Jill, how you explain that makes sense with what I've been hearing in the legislature, because the way that our funding system works, how we have the statewide ed fund, they can't just plop the CARES money into the statewide ed fund. They can't replace lost revenue. So they were trying to figure out a way that they could somehow allocate it to the school districts in FY21 and then immediately basically claw it back. So that sort of makes, this is helping me see that whole picture. I think that's probably how they're gonna try to take advantage of using the CARES fund um, to try to keep the ed fund whole. And certainly more uh, desirable than revotes. Great. Um, other questions for Grant or comments? Okay. Uh, next, okay. and thanks Grant, it was super helpful. This was... So in other news, <laughs> um, I asked for and received, as all of you should have gotten a letter, an email from me today that um, our snow days were waived as student days. So our last official day for students is now July or June 11th, sorry, June 11th, certainly not July 11th. Um, and this will allow us for six full days of professional time with teachers. Uh, Mike and I met for a good couple hours today to talk about what that might look like and what decisions need to be made before that. Uh, we have a process in place with principals and central office administrators and uh, teacher leaders around how decisions are going to be made over the next three or four weeks um, and throughout the summer uh, with some rapid feedback cycles that uh, hopefully we'll, we'll put in place. We have a laundry list, about a four page document now of decision points that need to be made. Um, so those six professional days will be absolutely essential in, in giving our educators time to prepare and plan and go into the summer feeling confident about what they need to do over the summer and, and, and right before school. So um, that was a decision that, that I made by asking the Agency of Education to waive those and they agreed that that was, that was a good thing to do. Uh, and then we've learned that RVS, I believe it was in the consent agenda this week, um, RVS, their nurse there retired. So it is a question for the board. Um, right now we have a 0.2 FTE nurse at Roxbury. It's a question for the board around, that's gonna be hard to hire just point to FTE is hard always to hire. Um, and going into the health situation that we are going into, is that what's needed at Roxbury or do we need something more? Um, so that's just kind of something for the board to, to uh, sit on for a bit. It doesn't necessarily need to be solved tonight in any way, but it's, it's definitely something that's weighing on my mind a little bit. Um, point two equals out to one day of work across a week. So we're going into significant health needs and, and we wanna make, make sure our staff, families and students feel safe in Roxbury Village School and I'm not sure if point two is gonna cut it. So that's just something for us to consider. Uh, but that's about it for this presentation. Any questions on those last two slides? Libby, what is your oh. recommendation for um, the nurse? Would it be half time or something less than that? It's really tough because it's such a small school, but the, the work of the nurse overnight changed. <laughs> it's not just, it's not Band-Aids, right? I'm taking temperatures right now. It's taking temperatures of the entire school population when they come in. Um, so, it's a, it's, it's, it's tough. I, I think my recommendation is if we can find somebody to contract with to, to do that job full time for the first half of the year, at least, mm -hmm. we might want to do that. Um, look at Grant. <laughs> I love it, Grant. <laughs> 
Um, but it's, it's, it's just basically what the need may be right now to ensure that our, our, our families feel safe sending their kids to school. Um, our nurses are responsible for designing our safety precautions, for making sure they're implemented, for being that voice when somebody's anxious about health considerations. And, and currently Roxbury doesn't have one. And I, I would point to is really hard to, to hire for. Mm -hmm. um, and even that it's like only, you only can answer your health questions on Thursday. You know, like it's, it's kind of a, it's a predicament. It really is. Right. I mean, do you know, and this is a question for, for Ryan and Gary too, um, do, do you know if there are any resources in the community, like a volunteer EMT or um, some kind of resource like that? I know Roxbury is a much smaller community, but I'm wondering if there are any kind of existing resources there or even throughout the rest of our district that could be leveraged to provide enhanced services. Um, without hiring a full-time nurse, unless the recommendation is we absolutely need a full-time nurse there. And to know, we're not the only ones in this position. Most small schools the size of Roxbury don't have a full-time nurse. So I think a lot of schools are grappling with this right now. No, that's a great question, Andrew. I know the administrative assistant who is in the building does a lot of first aid and a lot of nurse duties because she is there five days a week. And and she's seen it, and she's awesome. <laughs> I remember a sixth grade graduation a couple of years ago. The kids got up on the stage and thanked everybody in the building, and Miss Tina got a lot of thank yous for band-aids. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's that's a good example. Might we be able, if if we have an employee who's interested and is already there serving in one capacity, might we be able to provide some additional education to that employee so that they're more well-versed? I know it's not the same as having... Was, was the point two nurse, was that like a registered nurse or is that just, yeah. yeah they're a registered nurse and, we're, and, so that's and not we're not giving P Tina more professional learning so that she can become like, that's just not, yeah. that's not gonna happen. I mean, I was having ideas before <laughs> that were kind of dreaming of just, could we do some telethera telenursing with our three Montpelier nurses um, and just kind of give them an extra stipend and have them split it up. But really it's, there, there's a trust that needs to be developed and there's a on-site piece that's essential, I think, or will be essential going forward. Libby, the Norwich University has a nursing program. I wonder if I there's- I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah, any way to leverage that or, you know. I will have to reach out to them and see. Because that's about seven minutes from Roxbury, so. Yeah. And, and they, the number of hours they need to accumulate is astonishing. So like that might be a boon. The challenge, of course, being whether or not they are back on campus next year. Um, I but I was think, also just... Yeah, I think the plan thinking, is August, but I'm not sure. Um, I was thinking in also the range of the, the some of the kiddos that are in medical preparation professions at CVCC. I just know that actually some of them are employed right now as temperature takers, various places. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the idea of looking a little bit outside of the box since it is an outside of the box problem. Yeah, it is. Those are good ideas that we can certainly look into. Um, and just to continue with the ideas, is it possible that we could do a job share with the elementary school in Northfield? Which obviously is in another district, but they might also be having need, additional needs. Yeah, I'm not sure what their FTE is over there. I if they needed to up their FTE and we needed to up ours. And... Yeah, I can certainly ask Suzette some questions about that, the superintendent over in Northfield. All right. Thanks everyone. So other questions for Libby? Um, I think we can uh, move into executive Oops, are ready to. Great, and thank you for doing this and let us know how we can help. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we really, I really appreciate it through the whole process. Um, uh, your updates have been super helpful and uh, very thorough, so.
We greatly appreciate it. Uh, so am I used to actual information? I want to apologize to the Dell Corps who just joined the joined the board meeting. They were in the waiting room and I didn't see it because I was screen sharing my screen or I was sharing my screen. So I apologize to Laura and David who just came on. Yeah, and, and uh, unfortunately we're about to go into executive sessions. So. <laughs> That's my fault. I should have been flipping back to see it. I wasn't thinking about that. Libby, on that point though, aren't you, this is recorded, correct? Yes, with Orca, yep. So we, we can share that video with Laura and David um, if they need it, correct? Yes, most definitely. Or want it. And um, what is the turnaround time for providing that video if anybody else is interested? Uh, Anna, do you know that? She's coming up. It's actually oh. on live streams and the link to this video is currently on the site. And I will share my share this screen? Yeah. Um, to the saved video tomorrow. So it will always be up there. It's ready now. So it's, you can go to it. So can it be accessed pretty instantly? Yes, it's on the school board page currently and they can rewind today's live stream and then tomorrow it will become the posted video. All right, excellent. Um, so do I have, I think we first need a motion that it would be um, contrary to the interests of the board or jeopardize the interests of the board's negotiating position or whatever the magic words are, if we were to not go into executive session for the purposes of negotiations, does Bridget. anyone, anyone <laughs> um, like to make that motion? Bridget, you can, you can write it out and so we can take turns. <laughs> we're gonna have a that. All right. that um, I move that we find that discussing our contract negotiations in public session would put the board at a substantial disadvantage. Do I have a second? Second. Jill. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Emma. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Madiket. Aye. Mara. Aye. Now do we have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of uh, discussing contracts? This is Mara and I move that we go into executive session for purposes of discussing negotiations. Uh, Joe, second. I'll second that. Uh, Jill. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Emma. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Etiquette. Aye. Mara. Aye. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I think, Libby, do you need to make a room for us and shuttle okay. us all over there? Got it. Okay. Thank you.